Hey everybody, welcome back. Today is the turn of an iconic brand that hasn't entered a team into Formula 1 for over 60 years. Aston Martin with the AMR21. The brand of course comes with a huge amount of history in the automotive sense, but the team... Well, the team comes with a huge amount of history in the world of Formula 1 too. Last year, of course, they were known as Racing Point. They had a car. We termed it the pink Mercedes because of its similarity to the Mercedes of the year before. But it delivered some strong results. It was fighting at the front on a number of occasions across the season. And therefore, it's a great basis for the development of the 2021 car, even though it's now been rebranded, repainted and renamed. But this perhaps is the car that's actually going to look more different than any other car on the grid compared to its predecessor from 2020 and I'm going to explain kind of why that is. There are a number of really obvious details, I'm sure there are a number of other details that we cannot see at this stage but just from what was presented at the launch today we can clearly see they have been very very busy at the Silverstone base. Now, these are digital renders, like many teams present their cars these days, and of course, with the digital render, we have to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. However, this is a team that's running their car for real just tomorrow, less than 24 hours after the launch, and therefore it would seem almost silly to try and spend a lot of time developing a digital model to release to the press, when just a day later, you're gonna present the real thing on a racetrack where surely photos are going to be seen and picked up by the internet and by the wider world. These renders are incredibly detailed, incredibly high resolution, and I've got no reason to suggest that many of the details that we see here won't be carried on to the real car. So let's start with the front end. The wings, I tend to stay away from front and rear wings a little bit because they're so interchangeable, they're so circuit specific, aero package specific, and they're a thing that a team can change in and out with you know alarming frequency when they just want to tune the setup of the car so looking too much at what they've presented is a bit of a falsehood however they have clearly retained that wider span that outboard loaded front wing flap that many of the other teams have moved away from loading all of the inboard section and tapering away at the outboard edge just to control the outwash that takes away that turbulent tire wake that we keep talking about here, they've taken a much wider span on the front wing, loading up all the way across. Generally, that's a, a, an option to produce, in theory at least, more downforce at the front end, as long as you can control the other bits and pieces, like tyre wake, further downstream. The nose cone, similar shape to before. You can see a very pronounced cutaway just after the leading edge of the nose that leads very nicely into this long extended cape that we've seen before. The airflow hitting the front of the nose, spilling over. You can almost see the channel where the air is going to pass. Spilling over the edge of the nose, being controlled by that long cape and then fed into the top of the floor and the barge board and the keel of the car, as we call it. A really important area, even more so this year than previous years because of the aerodynamic changes by regulation towards the rear of the car controlling the flow all the way from the front and guiding it to end up at the back of the car where you need it starts right here. Front suspension looks the same as it was before but I've got this high res detailed image so I thought I'd show you this raised bracket protruding off the upright which is inside the wheel sticking up here to raise the height of that upper wishbone. The reason they do that is to get this member of suspension as high as possible therefore they can raise the lower wishbone look the lower wishbone way up above the halfway point in terms of height of the wheel in my day the lower wishbone used to be all the way down here but now what they're trying to do is raise all that suspension as high as they possibly can using that little extended bracket there to do the top wishbone so that there's a clearer path underneath all of those suspension components for the flow coming off the front wing passing through there and on towards the barge boards, the side pods and of course the rear of the car. So this is just to show you how a lot of teams are doing it now with this really nice extended bracket to get everything up and essentially out of the way. With this image we can get quite a lot of detail by zooming in but I just want to show you the little detail around the trailing edge of the front wing end plate. It's all designed to give a gap for the flow coming off the front wing again trying to create this outwash effect through this cutaway through this cutaway here 
to drag away from the car that messy, swirling, turbulent tyre wake that we've spoken about. But actually, it's further downstream where we can really zoom in, get some detail and understand where some of the bigger changes that this car has had made over the winter from where it left off last year. Now this is where Aston Martin have put a lot of work and effort in. They've actually spent their two permitted development tokens this year on changing the chassis. Something that, other than McLaren doing it for reasons of accepting the new Mercedes engine, I don't think any other team has chosen to do. It's done that way because not many other teams see performance benefit in changing the monocoque, the chassis, which is more of a safety cell than anything else. As long as you had a decent one last year, it should be decent again this year, and it's not the most efficient way to spend your tokens. Unless you're Aston Martin, and what they did in the guise of Racing Point last year was change the crash structure elements on the side of the chassis to lower the side pod inlet. Now last year that was fine, it was an area they decided to go down, it sort of bucked the trend that many other teams are doing in raising the inlet, the opening, as high as possible. They went the other way, and look, it's fine, it works for them off the back of that concept developed by Mercedes. Mercedes in the meantime went back rearwards and, and sent the inlet as high as they possibly could, and this year Aston Martin have done the same. The reason that's so important this year is because we've lost some of the effectiveness that though the floor detail from previous years gave us in terms of helping to manipulate the airflow around the diffuser, helping to create the most powerful effect from the underside of the car by sealing the edges of the floor. Well, because we can't do that anymore, because we've lost that section at the rear of the floor that regulations have now mandated has to go, now what becomes key is getting as much airflow underneath the side of the side pod and then in towards the back of the floor running around the edges through a steep undercut in many cases, getting into that coke bottle area, the area that tightens up right at the back of the chassis. You can't do that as effectively if the inlet is lower because there's less scope to have a slender undercut to create that channel for the flow to, to follow. So by moving the inlet higher, we get more opportunity to create a steeper undercut underneath the side of the uh, side pod guiding that flow around that contour and in towards the rear of the car. Now, you might say, well, isn't that just the side pod? Isn't that just a case of producing new bodywork? It isn't, because to get that inlet as high as possible, the side impact structure, the crash structure that's mandated on all cars, has to be placed at a different position on the side of the chassis, and it's part of the chassis. It's not something you can just move without using those tokens to change the actual chassis itself. So Aston Martin have decided that's a valuable way to spend their tokens. I'm not sure what other changes they may have made to the chassis, but I'm sure, given they had the scope for development having used the tokens, they would have made minor tweaks in a number of different areas. But that's a really key one, a really interesting one, and forms part of the philosophy that leads on towards the rear of the car. There's some really nice close-up detail around the barge balls. I mean, this section is darkened. Again, as I keep mentioning as a caveat, these are the areas that are really going to be changing on an almost daily basis, particularly when we get to pre-season testing, and I'm sure will all change again by the time we get to the first race. But it's nice to see this close-up in so much detail, albeit on a render. Look at that, the Venetian blind style elements on the side there, that's interesting. These areas around the leading edge of the floor and the trailing edge of the barge board, again, massively important in trying to regain some of that lost performance at the rear of the car with the changes to the floor. Let's move further back along the floor then. This is that undercut I'm talking about that's created with the higher side pod, allowing the flow to get into this channel, follow the contours of that round, almost following the underneath of that red stripe and aiming off towards the rear of the gearbox and then the top of the diffuser, helping to generate downforce that way. But look at this, this is the edge of the floor. Lots of really close up detail around here. And this is an area that I'm expecting every team to be coming up with things like this. Many teams have launched their cars showing just blank or nothing there. Mercedes openly hid this particular section of their car. But Aston Martin have re released some detailed images. Whether it stays like this or continues to develop, we'll wait and see. But these are the, the kinds of areas that people are having to work on because of having lost that section at the rear of the car. But look at this, a little extra uh, element running all the way along the edge there. This 
trailing edge here is absolutely designed to create a vortex spinning up off these trailing edges. Vortex, a spinning path of air that might help to regain some of the ceiling effect that a lot of the slots and flick ups and that wider floor section that we used to have used to be able to gain. Sealing along the gap between the floor and the racetrack is a crucial part of trying to regain the power of the diffuser, stopping leakage from or into that diffuser further back down the car. And these are the kinds of areas that teams are going to start working on to try and overcome some of that. You can see what's happening here in the direction of flow, passing flow out here, trying to uh, interact with the rear tyre wake and take that away from the diffuser. That's what we used to try and do, protect with a spiralling uh, wall of vortices, protect the rear tyre wake from the powerful, efficient diffuser under the car. Now we have to use things like this that are all clearly designed to start energising the airflow and then directing it, perhaps dragging away again the messy rear tyre wake that can be so impactful further downstream. Further along then, this is where the regulations now say we have to have this big triangular cutout from where the floor used to be. More fins here and more fins in here, little vertical fins. Again, doing exactly the same thing, trying to protect the crucial areas of the floor, trying to form some kind of seal with the spinning vortices that will be powered up off these between that tyre and the diffuser. So much work is going to be going in. In fact, I would say a huge, a massive proportion of everybody's wind tunnel time or CFD time, development time in terms of aero, is going to be around these areas and further upstream trying to recover what we've lost within the regulations. It was all done to try and save costs, trying to protect the tyres in the least or the most cost efficient way. But the reality is everyone's having to put so much resource into this because it's a significant change that actually it's going to cost everyone a fortune. OK, zooming out a little bit, you can start to see very Mercedes-esque, slimmed down, almost shrink wrapped bodywork. We saw it on the Mercedes that was revealed just yesterday, how a very similar looking, not exactly the same, but similar looking bulge where a component from the engine just can't be fitted into the actual package. And so therefore, to gain aero efficiency, they just shrink down the bodywork to almost cover the bulging components underneath. It does give you a much slimmer and much more efficient overall aero package. And the cost of that in terms of aero is very, very little much less so than the gain by shrinking the whole package down. So not that surprising that given the tie up between these guys and Mercedes, particularly over previous years, but also with that updated Mercedes power unit, we've now got a very similar looking concept, very slimline concept around here. Now, when I talked about this car being very different to the one that went before, one of the other main reasons, not only have they changed the chassis, they opted through this loophole in the regulations to take a completely updated rear suspension package from Mercedes free of charge in terms of tokens. This was a loophole in the regulations that a lot of people, Ferrari particularly, were unhappy about. But if you're a customer team buying these components, a year old set of components last year from a parent company, as these guys were, you were then free to update this package from your parent company to the what is now a year old package. So the 2020 package is now on the back of this car. Now, that's a significant change because if you remember in 2020, Mercedes went with a really quite significantly different setup on the rear suspension designed to give some major aerodynamic benefits at this end of the car. These guys will now benefit from that without having to use tokens in that area. It's quite a big deal. They knew about this, they made the decision a long time ago, a long way early into last season, and therefore have been able to optimize their design around that, knowing that it's coming, with all the data that Mercedes are freely able to supply them because of that decision. So this is a car that's benefited from quite a lot of change in a time of year where the regulations were all set out and designed to try and minimise the change from one year to the next. Will it be enough? Only time will tell, but the thing looks good. It had a great basis to start from last year. The team's building and growing in terms of resources and with all the people that we know have been successful over many years with a much smaller budget, 
it's fair to say things could be looking good for Aston Martin in 2021. 